let me get now to the event of the day, and uh, we're going to have a presentation of uh, remarks from Gina Raimondo, and then we'll have a conversation. Uh, Gina Raimondo is somebody I've known for quite some time. She's a very impressive background. Very briefly, uh, she's from Providence. Um, her grandfather was an immigrant to this country, um, and she grew up in a, in a, a tight Italian neighborhood in uh, Providence. Um, and as we'll talk about probably later, one of her babysitters was Senator Jack Reed. He wasn't a senator then. Um, but uh, she uh, uh, was first in her class, valedictorian of her high school, went to Harvard, was a top economics student in Harvard at that time, won a Rhodes Scholarship, graduate of Yale Law School. Um, she went back to Providence and didn't go uh, to New York or other great places or Washington. She went back to Providence where she built a very successful venture capital firm and then she then ran uh, in 2010 to become the state treasurer of uh, Rhode Island, and she won. And then in 2014, she ran for governor of Rhode Island and won, and then she was reelected in 2018. And in serving in her second term, she was asked by uh, the president-elect to serve as Secretary of Commerce, and she is now uh, serving as the 40th Secretary of Commerce. And it's a person I've known for a number of years and I greatly admired uh, what she's done in Rhode Island and what she's doing now. So without any further ado, it's my honor to introduce the Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo. Oh, let's see, you think I need this? Is that better? Thank you, David. I remember the first time we met. It was in 2011. I was the treasurer, and uh, David came to call on me um, because I was managing the state's pension fund. And I remember at that time being struck by your humility. And we talked for an hour and a half, and um, I'm, I'm not sure whether we invested. If we didn't, we should have. But um, we've stayed friends since, and I greatly admire the business you've built and all of your civic obligations, so thank you. Uh, for me, it is a great honor to be here with all of you today. Uh, I see some familiar faces in the crowd, uh, and it's just exciting that we can be together in person, uh, and I'm just so pleased to be here. Um, over the past six months, since since getting this job, I've been meeting with hundreds uh, of business leaders, entrepreneurs, trade groups across industries, members of Congress, labor leaders, trying to develop the Commerce Department strategy and really determine how I can best serve the President in his Build Back Better agenda. And through all of these conversations, we've come to the conclusion that the Commerce Department needs to be in pursuit of a single overarching goal, which is to improve America's competitiveness so that our workers and our companies can succeed on the global stage. So everything I do will be to improve competitiveness. It means prioritizing investments in our people, our infrastructure, our technology, and our supply chains. It also means you will see the Commerce Department playing a more critical role in the President's domestic economic agenda than the Commerce Department or Commerce Secretary has played in a very long time. Because the reality is, as you all know, in order to improve our businesses' ability to compete abroad, we need to improve our capabilities here at home, invest in America. Now, this year, since the beginning of the year, we see great economic momentum in this economy. And our economy is showing, the American economy is resilient despite COVID, despite the Delta variant, despite supply chain disruptions. People ask me, you know, Secretary, what do you think of the economy? I say, I'm bullish. I'm bullish on the American economy and I'm bullish on the American people. But if we want to take this short-term economic growth and prosperity and translate it into long-term economic prosperity, then we need to make investments so that all Americans can benefit. Now, as David said, um, for me, this is personal. My grandpa came here from Italy by himself on a boat at 14 years old, an immigrant to this country. My dad served in the Second World War in the Navy, proudly. And he went to college, the first guy in our family who went to college because of the GI Bill. 
My mom stayed home, raising my brother, my sister, and me. And my dad, because he had that college degree on the GI Bill, got a good middle, got a good job at the Bull of a Watch factory in Rhode Island, which gave my family a, a decent middle class life. But after 28 years, you know what happened to manufacturing in Rhode Island and all over the country. His job and all of his buddies' jobs went to China. And I watched my dad. It was really hard for him and my family. And I learned watching him. His job wasn't just about a paycheck. It was about dignity. Having a decent job in manufacturing gave my family a middle class life, but gave my dad dignity. And what happened to him all those years ago was, of course, a part of the larger American story, a story of America's declining investment in our workers, in our economy, in our manufacturing base. So when the president, or president-elect, asked me if I would serve in this role in his cabinet, I said yes with excitement because I want to play a role in revitalizing America's manufacturing base, America's economy, and create more good middle-class jobs right here in America. And you all know the story. During the 80s, or starting in the 80s, manufacturers started shifting production overseas in search of cheap labor. And in the 40 years since then, our manufacturing sector, our workforce, and innovation have atrophied consistently because of lack of investment. Now you all know, you all run successful businesses. You know to, to run a profitable business, you have to invest in your core strengths, systems, and people. Well, the same thing is true for our country. For America to compete on the global stage, we need to invest domestically in our strengths, our workforce, our businesses, our small businesses, and innovation. I'm looking at my pal Steve Case when I say innovation. So today I'd like to, um, if you'll permit me, go through the four key areas that the Department of Commerce is going to do to focus on just that. First, we're going to focus on diversifying our supply chains and revitalizing American manufacturing. As we've let our manufacturing base shrink and move overseas, we've also exposed ourselves to supply chain vulnerabilities. The photographer who took my photos ahead of time said, when am I going to be able to buy a car? <laughs> we all are seeing the, manufac you know, the lack of manufacturing and the bottlenecks in supply chains. Listen to this. 25% of small and medium-sized manufacturers have disappeared in this country over the past 30 years. They're gone. All the little tool makers and electroplaters in Rhode Island, gone. And the same is true all over the Midwest. So today, we're seeing the impacts of that vulnerability all across our supply chain. Bottlenecks in home building materials, any of you renovating your house know that now? Shortages of electronics and batteries and pharmaceuticals. And demand is surging, and these problems are only going to become more acute. Of course, this is most acute in a product, which is the building blocks of our digital economy, semiconductors. Our lives are, can't run without semiconductors. Our phones, our cars, our medical equipment. We created the semiconductor industry in the United States of America not that long ago. Not that long ago, we produced 40% of all the world's chips. Today, we produce 12% of all the world's chips. We produce 0% of the leading edge, most sophisticated chips in the United States of America. That is an alarming statistic, and we have to get to work now. That presents a national security problem and an economic security problem. Since I've been in office at the President's direction, I've been working on this problem, convening stakeholders in the semiconductor industry, reaching out to them to try to find solutions. I'm working hard on the Hill um, to have them establish a robust supply chain resiliency office within the Department of Commerce, which would allow us to monitor all supply chains so we don't wind up in this situation again. I'm pressing Congress to fund the CHIPS Act, 
which would send $52 billion to the Department of Commerce so we can stimulate the domestic production of chips. And all of these are critical investments that the President has proposed to strengthen our manufacturing economy and protect Americans from supply chain disruptions in the future. Forecasts indicate that if we strengthen American supply chains in manufacturing, we'll boost GDP by up to $460 billion and add a million and a half jobs in America. Which leads me to my second goal, which is workforce. I hear from businesses all the time that they're struggling to find workers with the skills they need. We need to prepare our American workers to meet the demands of our modern, digital, data, tech-driven economy. And the fact is we have, as a country, been under-investing in worker training for a long time. We spend a fraction of what other countries spend on apprenticeships and workforce development. This is an area that I focused greatly on when I was the governor of Rhode Island. When I took office, Rhode Island, like a lot of states, had a what I call train and pray model. Train people in what you think they need and pray they get a job. We changed it. We reached out to business, partnered with business, and we changed it to train and hire, resulting in the lowest unemployment rate in Rhode Island in a generation. So we want to work with you. The President's calling for investments in apprenticeships and job training in his Build Back Better Act. And I want to work hand in hand with business to make sure that these are effective in partnership with the Department of Labor and Education. For the first time in the Commerce Department's history, earlier this year, I launched our own grant program that to invest in industry-led apprenticeships and workforce training efforts with a focus on equity to make sure women and people of color are not left behind. And the truth of it is, we need your leadership. This is an area where I, businesses have to be at the center of the table not just at the table. We need your help to design effective job training curriculum and initiatives, and we need you to hire these folks. Look, if somebody has the guts to get retrained mid-career, we need you to commit to hiring them, assuming they have, they're competent and have the skills that you need. 70% of Americans don't have a four-year college degree. So if you're gonna keep hiring the traditional way of checking the box, and looking for the four-year college degree, I need you to think about changing that model so everybody can have a job if they have the skills and competencies that you require. Our third objective at Commerce is to enhance our innovation economy and make sure it reaches every corner of America. America has the world's best universities, research centers, entrepreneurs, and we are attracting talent from all over the world. Entrepreneurs from all over the world want to set up their companies in America. But here's the reality. We're falling behind. At, you, to have innovation, innovation rests upon the foundation of research and development, period. And over the last few decades, this country's public investment in research and development is declining precipitously. We don't lead the world anymore. We no longer lead the world on important research and development and scientific progress. China's growth rate and research and development spending is more than three times that of the United States of America, and we have fallen to 10th place as, as R&D as a percent of our GDP. It's just a fact. If we want to remain at the forefront of innovation, we must expand R&D investments so that we can move innovations from the lab to the marketplace at 21st century speed. The President's Build Back Better Act calls for big investments in the National Science Foundation, upgrades in labs across the country, and expansions of climate change innovation. It also will send a record amount of money to the Department of Commerce to invest to make sure every American has access to high-speed, affordable broadband. COVID showed us all, broadband is not a luxury. It's required to do your job, go to school, and see the doctor. 
30 million Americans lack broadband. 35% of Americans in rural areas don't have high-speed broadband. If we want to compete on the global stage, we need to close the digital divide. It's also true that we have to make sure that our innovation isn't just in a few places. It's got to get everywhere in America. Once the House passes its version of the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act, they'll be sending $10 billion to the Department of Commerce to invest in regional tech hubs across the country. We need to make sure that AI, robotics, quantum computing, biotechnology is happening in the heartland of America, not just, no offense, D.C., New York, Boston, Silicon Valley. Those markets don't corner the market on entrepreneurship. They do corner the market on capital. And so as part of my mission in investing the regional tech cup money, it's to get spread innovation throughout America. It also means we need to invest in a clean energy future. If we have any hope of getting to net zero emission by 2050, we need to improve our innovation because we, it depends upon technologies that don't even exist today. Underpinning everything that I'm talking about and everything that we will do is the value of equity. And I mean that very sincerely. The truth of it is, our economy cannot fully recover unless everyone can fully participate. That means women, that means people of color, that means people who live in rural districts and tribal lands and every place in America. And it means businesses committing themselves to equity as a core business strategy, not just an HR function, not just a diversity task force. It's, the, the fact is, racial and gender diversity improves a company's bottom line. You know that. Cash flows for diverse companies are more than double that of companies with less diverse workforces. Companies with women in leadership perform better, make wiser decisions, and have been found to increase profit margins by almost 50%. But yet, women are still excluded from the C-suite, earn 82 cents on the dollar for, for every dollar men earn even less for women of color. When women start businesses, it's harder for them to access capital. We still have two million women out of the workforce who fell out of the workforce during COVID because they can't access childcare. If we want to tap into the full productivity of America, we have to provide childcare and care for our elderly and disabled loved ones. We have to make diversity a competitive advantage. Which leads me to my final point, ensuring that Americans' businesses can compete globally. I have no doubt, there is no doubt, that when American businesses have a fair shot at accessing global markets and receive fair treatment from foreign governments, our economy is enhanced by foreign competition. But the reality is American businesses shouldn't have to compete against foreign governments. We know China undercuts American companies by engaging in anti-competitive coercive activities, denying us access to their markets, flooding our markets with overly subsidized products into the U.S. market. We know China, Iran, Russia, and North Korea misuse American technologies and are directing cyber attacks against our companies. All of this threatens our economic and national security. And I want you to know that at the Commerce Department, we have powerful tools to help level the global playing field and advocate for American businesses, and we plan to use them to the greatest extent possible to level the playing field for American businesses and make sure that we can access foreign markets. We're going to enforce export controls, set cybersecurity standards, and protect your IP. And we'll do all this working closely with our allies who share our democratic values, protecting open data flows, and creating standards for critical and emerging technology. 
I heard a statistic recently, which is jarring if you think about it. For the first time since the Second World War, the GDP of autocracies has outpaced the GDP of the world's democracies. So that means partnerships with countries that share our values are critical. In fact, I'll be leaving here to go to Pittsburgh to be one of the chairs of the US-EU Trade and Technology Council. So I'm going to end with this. And it's something that the president tells us all the time. In a very real and profound way, we are at an inflection point as a nation. And we have choices, business and government. We have choices before us which will determine what happens to our country, our democracy, our capitalism at this point in our nation's history. If we tap into America's greatest strengths, our unrivaled innovation, our diversity of talent, our amazing universities, our top-notch entrepreneurs, our strong relationships with our allies who share our values, then we'll win. We will outcompete. And that is what we will do at the Commerce Department, working in partnership with business leaders like you to rebuild America, to invest in our workforce, to invest in our communities, and to invest in American industries. The truth is, so many of the problems in our country right now have been created and exacerbated by income inequality. And if we don't meet the demands of this moment, then that inequality will get worse. And I think the divisions we're facing in our economy, in our communities, and our politics will deepen. So as we recover from this pandemic, now is the time for business and government to work hand in hand to rebuild our economy. Now is the time to prioritize investments in our supply chains, our workforce, our innovation, all while ensuring equity. And if we do this, if we make these investments, then our democracy will be stronger and our economy will be more competitive now and in the long run for decades to come. And if we don't, I really do believe that both will decline at a time when democracy and capitalism are being challenged all around the world. So today I'm here filled with excitement to ask you, the business community, to partner with our administration and to partner with me and my team in the Department of Commerce. Give us your ideas, work with us, help us to make these investments that will enable America and your businesses to compete in the 21st century on the global stage. So thank you for having me. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So you've had to come to Washington during a COVID period of time. But what's it like moving from Rhode Island with their family to move here and get adjusted with schools and houses? And how did that all work out? Uh, surprisingly well, I have to say. Um, everyone we've met here has been incredibly friendly. The president saw my daughter. I have, a, I have a daughter who's entering her senior year in high school, which is a tough time to move. And he saw Cece the other day and, and said, oh, I'm sorry I made you do that. Um, but they're doing great. They're flourishing. And you know, we're all excited to be down here. We're living in Georgetown. And the community's been terrific. And what's the difference between being governor of the state of Rhode Island, which you were for six years, and being a cabinet officer? In, in Rhode Island, you're not, it's like king of the hill, queen of the hill. You're in charge of everything. Uh, here, you've got a lot of other people in the cabinet, and some people on Capitol Hill think they're important too. So um, what's it like? So I'm quite sure the Rhode Island legislature never thought that I was the queen of the hill. Okay. In fact, they, they made it their business to make sure I knew that I was not queen of the hill, um, which is to say that 
as the governor, I spent an enormous amount of time, you know, moving my agenda by working with the legislature, a huge amount of time, across the aisle with people I didn't agree with. And I think, and so that part, you know, talking to senators, as I said, I was very involved in the infrastructure negotiations. I know how to do that. That's very familiar to me. Um, I take to it a real respect. You know, I think it's so important to respect folks on the other side of the aisle. So I enjoy that. It's, it's, it's good. Right. I mean, look, it's bigger, you know, right. okay. it's bigger. My, my, I, I'm in an office building with 2 million square feet. I'm not sure Rhode Island state government had 2 million square feet. So, but you know, th there are differences, but fundamentally making the case to Congress, making the case to the people, reaching out to the business community, uh, is all very familiar to me, and it's what I enjoy right. doing. So have you been running the department remotely a bit for a while, or you now is everybody coming back? And what's your policy going to be? Everybody comes back, they have to be vaccinated, or how does it work? So we are still primarily remote. I have been here. Um, my team in the secretary's office is all in the office. Um, mostly the, the career staff are welcome to come. They're invited to be here. Um, we, they need to be vaccinated and it's a slow trickle. Okay, let's talk about the infrastructure. Which is very hard, right? It makes it hard to team build. I have an office that holds thousands of people. Sometimes I just walk around right. trying to find people, say hello, and it's, it's, it's difficult. Well, talk about the department for a moment. The department is a hodgepodge, some people might say, of many different things. It used to be called a Noah's Ark or whatever you want to say. Were you shocked or surprised at how many different disparate parts of the Commerce Department there are? I sure was. Um, as I said, when I talked to the president-elect about doing this, it was a lot about manufacturing, supply chains, export promotion. And then after I took the job, I started studying. And I realized I have the Weather Service, and NOAA, and the Census. So um, I, I've learned okay. a lot. So when you have the weather service, can you call them in the morning and say what's really going to happen? Or do they give you special about, insights? About a month ago, I had to go home for a wedding. And I texted a friend of mine and said, what's the weather in Rhode Island this weekend? And she wrote back, don't you run the weather service? <laughs> um, so if you want to say a hurricane is occurring a certain place, you can do that or no? You no, can't do no, that. no, no, no. OK, all right. No political interference with career staff work. Okay. So let's talk about the infrastructure bill. You've been heavily involved in that, and it appears that on Thursday of this week, um, the Speaker of the House is going to call for a vote, and presumably she's not going to call for a vote if she doesn't have the votes, at least that's the presumption. So do you think that maybe after a, you know, half a year of working on this, it'll probably happen now? I do. I'm optimistic. Okay. You know, as I said, I know how, I've worked with legislators for a long time. It's not done till it's done, but we're feeling optimistic. So you, let's suppose it passes the House, then it doesn't have to go back to the Senate because it's identical. So it becomes law, the President will sign it. So um, broadband has about, uh, it's about, is it about uh, 55 billion? It's 65 in total and about 45 comes to the Commerce Department. Okay. So um, normally broadband, which you talked about in your remarks, is something that um, a cable company would build out or a telephone company build out your access to the internet or broadband. Why does the government need to get in the middle of putting money into this, and who really controls it? Is the Commerce Department going to tell the companies what to do, or you tell state governments? Who's going to decide where this money goes, and, and why are and how will the, the private companies benefit from this in, uh, in, influx of money? Yes, yeah, all good questions. So, as I said in my remarks, it's America's behind. You know, tens of millions of Americans don't have broadband, particularly in rural areas tribal areas, or in places like Rhode Island, which aren't rural, it's not so much an issue of access as affordability. And so we do, the market isn't accomplishing what needs to be accomplished, which is every American having broadband. So the 45 billion is coming to the Commerce Department. We're going to put that out through a grant making progress to states and work with states um, with a focus on the unserved. So the good news is the FCC's maps are now pretty good. We know where there's lack of coverage for whatever reason. It's too expensive to have it built out. It's expensive to lay fiber, et cetera. On the basis of you know, where, where there's no service, 
We're going to make investments, which could go to, to big companies, could go to municipal co-ops. Um, it could go to consumers if it's just an issue of affordability and not an issue of fiber. But the bottom line is my goal, my mission is every American has broadband at their house that they can afford and we're going to work flexibly in a state-by-state -state basis. Right. So have you ever noticed if you're in a foreign country, you can call somebody from there to the United States, a cell phone coverage works perfectly. If you're from driving from Dulles to downtown Washington, sometimes it doesn't work. So you're going to fix that, right? I'm on it. Okay. I have to, I'm not going to tell you exactly where I live, but as I said, I'm in Georgetown, in the okay. capital city, and I can't use my cell phone in my house. OK. So we're going to fix that. That'll I'm be gonna, good. Yes. OK. So let's talk about uh, uh, some other things going on in Capitol Hill. They're very busy these days. Um, so are you shocked that the debt limit uh, is uh, a barrier between the Democrats and Republicans? And what's going to happen there? I'm not shocked because I've been in elected politics for 10 years, but it's inexcusable. I mean, by the way, I've called a dozen CEOs and they've all come out publicly, you know, CEO of Amazon, Walmart, every CEO I've asked has said, this is ridiculous. We've raised the debt limit, I think, 65 times in the past few decades. It doesn't allow us to spend more money. It just allows us to run the government. It's pure politics. You know, it's been done on a bipartisan basis. Republicans voted for it in 2019. So I, I, I don't know what will happen. I, I hope, I, this should be a no-brainer. This should be done swiftly across party lines so the world can see our government functioning. Right. But will it? I don't know. I don't know what will happen. Should we even have a debt limit? I mean, isn't it kind of antiquated? Most uh, countries don't have a debt limit. Is there any need for a debt limit at this point? I think it should be seriously looked at because this brinksmanship that we go through, this political okay. theater we go through every time, is obviously, you would not run your businesses that way. And I do f feel very strongly about what I said. I mean, the, the, it's not an exaggeration to say the world is watching. The world is watching to see whether our democracy and our democratic institutions and our government can function. Um, I was in Europe in June with the president, and they're wondering, is America back? Can you get things done on a bipartisan basis? And if we can't even raise the debt limit on a bipartisan basis, what do you tell these people in Europe when you're there and they ask you these questions? I say, yes, we are. Stay tuned. We're about to pass the bipartisan infrastructure framework okay. and All we're right. going to get the debt limit raised and we're going to get big things done. Okay. So infrastructure bill is probably going to pass, let's say. The debt limit will eventually get taken care of. But by the way, on that, um, what I don't understand, or maybe you can explain to me your background in politics, why uh, we just, the, the Democrats have the votes to pass the debt limit. All they have to do is get 51 votes. They have 51 in the Senate. They have enough in the House. Why just don't they just don't Republicans let them vote for it? The Republicans could, you know, force it to a filibuster, which would, which we need this to be done swiftly. I think Janet Yellen said, uh, like mid October, this becomes a problem. But also, this should be done quickly on a unanimous vote. So I think that I give President Biden a huge amount of credit. He believes in bipartisanship. He knows. In his, in his soul, in his bones, he believes in it. Um, he respects Republicans. He, he's constantly coaching us and his team to work with Republicans. But he also knows the world needs to see our, our democracy mm -hmm. working. All right, so we also have on Capitol Hill the uh, ability to keep the government f functioning, which is to, to extend the government's uh, spending bills. Uh, do you think that's going to pass as well? Or are you playing, preparing for a shutdown? Uh, I think both. I think, yes, it will happen, but we're preparing for a shutdown. So I do think it will happen. I think it'll go up to the wire, unfortunately. Uh, but of course, we're getting prepared. Again, not any, all could be avoided. Bad for the markets, bad for the right. economy, bad for businesses need and deserve some stability. And I just, I just wish Congress could kind of do the right thing without regard for their own kind of selfish short-term politics. So when you talk to Republican members in private, do they ever say things that they don't say in public to you? Or that never happens? Of course. <laughs> I know, of course. All right, and By so the way, 
When I was the treasurer of Rhode Island, I ushered, th I, I was a Democrat, I am a Democrat, I ushered through a huge um, pension, public pension system reform. And I was trying to whip votes in the legislature and I'd go talk to Democrats and say, will you vote for this, the pension reform? And they would say, listen, I know you're right, I know we have to do it, I know it's gonna bankrupt our cities and towns. They'd say that, but I'm not gonna vote for it because I'm afraid I'm afraid of the politics. And I, we eventually got it done by a huge vote. Um, but I would say to them what I say to these senators, which is like, you came here to do a job, do the right thing, and if you are booted out, wear it as a badge of honor. But I don't think you will be if you right. produce results. So we have another bill on Capitol Hill, which is the uh, budget reconciliation bill, the whole complicated, the 3.5 trillion bill and so forth. Um, is the president prepared to take less than $3.5 The pre The president's prepared to compromise. I think Speaker Pelosi said the other night, you know, it seems self-evident that it's not going to be the full $3.5 trillion. But the, from the beginning, the president has said, I'm open to compromise. He just won't compromise on two things. He won't raise taxes on people making less than $400,000 a year. And he won't accept inaction. So, you know, okay. doing nothing is what the president won't accept, but compromising, yes. Okay, so um, if the bill is less than 3.5 trillion, whatever the number is, would the taxes that are necessary to pay for that be presumably less than in his original proposal? Correct. So all the taxes may be less some way. We don't know yet what they will be. Okay, and let's say uh, the, the bill doesn't pass. Um, mm. Is there any chance you think there won't be some kind of budget reconciliation at some point? Or you think there will be some reconciliation, some compromise will get I think there eventually. will be. You know, as I'm sitting here Tuesday afternoon, I, I, think, this, I think something big will happen. Okay. So when you talk to corporate CEOs and they say, well, we have a corporate tax rate now of, let's say, 21 percent, uh, the president's proposal is to increase it. Um, did they say, look, we don't mind having a corporate tax rate, we can't say that publicly, but we, we expect some increase? Yes, some of them do. Most of them do. You know, what I have heard is, gosh, you have to go all the way up to 28. You know, we, we know 21 is too low, we know we need to raise revenue. How, do you, how would you feel about 25, 26? You know, people have a different number. Some people have issues with the guilty going up as high. But everyone I have heard from has said, we want universal broadband. We want investments in apprenticeships and job training. We want better infrastructure. We, we want child care and paid leave. Climate change, you know, we have to make investments in climate change. So then the question becomes, well, how much investment and how do you pay for it? But I have not heard from a business executive who says, it, can't, it, has, it, it cannot go a penny above 21%. Okay, let's talk about uh, Europe. You're going to uh, uh, meet with some European leaders in Pittsburgh later today. Are we going to um, have a trade agreement of some type with Europe that's beyond what we already have as a way to kind of counter what's going on with China? Or it's too early to say what you're going to get out of the agreement? That's a really good question. At the moment, I have, I have two big areas of focus with the Europeans. One is to see if we can resolve the 232 steel and aluminum tariffs. Um, that has created tremendous tension in we have our relationship. tariffs on our allies on steel and aluminum. Exactly. So they're not happy. Not happy, yeah. National security tariffs on our allies sending us steel. They feel offended that we call them a national right. security threat. So I'm trying to and deal with that. And you're doing it in Pittsburgh because that's where the steel people are? I'm doing it in Pittsburgh because it's, I chose Pittsburgh, actually, because okay. I, I wanted to show, as I said in my comments, tech needs to be everywhere in America, not just New York, Boston, Austin, Silicon Valley. And Pittsburgh is a great story of a community that has built up based upon their tech and AI, machine learning, and biotech. Um, in any event, we have, we've got some work to do with the Europeans to get past this irritant. Also, they are contemplating some really challenging regulations of our tech platform companies. 
um, their Digital Markets Act, which I, I need to express strongly to them our reservations about that. Well, they seem to be imposing taxes on some of our big tech companies yeah. and other constraints and so forth, so uh, I guess you're arguing against that. Strongly, yeah. But in order to, I'll just say it, you know, like President Trump and the last administration didn't treat our allies well. Right. I've got, I've got some. I have to make okay. up for that. You have to smooth that over to regain okay. some trust before we can get to digital services right. and digital markets. Now, act. Are the French showing up at this meeting? They are, but right. it was in doubt. But it's all happening. Okay. So uh, let's talk about some tariffs that were imposed on China. Uh, by the way, do you know who actually pays tariffs? Is it the American people that pay them, or is it the Chinese that pay these tariffs? President what? Trump always said that the tariffs were paid by the Chinese, but isn't it really the, the consumer that pays the tariffs? Oh, yes. Sorry. I wasn't sure where you were going with that. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so the tariffs that we have imposed, and actually American consumers are really paying yeah. these tariffs, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, why are we keeping the tariffs on? They were imposed by President Trump, and then he had some uh, trade agreements, so why don't we get rid of the tariffs? Isn't that an irritant with the Chinese? Mm. Okay, so I, look, ta tariffs are a tactic, not a strategy. Tariffs are one tool in our toolbox. We need to kind of step back and have a strategy with respect to China, which is to say, you know, they are, they are not abiding by the phase one purchase agreements, not even close. I don't know if Boeing is here, but, you know, there's, there's they're here, you know, there's, tens of billions of dollars of planes that Chinese airlines want to buy and the Chinese government is standing in the way of it. So in any event, we, the Chinese need to play by the rules. They need to, we need to hold their feet to the fire and hold them accountable. If that can't happen, then we'll have to look at, you know, other measures, more aggressive measures. But right now, um, Fundamentally, we need a robust commercial relationship with them that does not hurt our national security. We need a level playing field, and they need to follow the rules. And so, you know, we need to pursue that strategy. The U.S.-China relationship doesn't seem to have gotten much better since President Trump left. It wasn't probably that great when he left, but it seems as if this administration has a very, what some, some would say, a hardline policy on China. I don't know if you would agree with that characterization, but do you see anything in the offing that would make you think we're likely to get a closer relationship with China on commercial or other matters in the near future? I don't think we're hardline so much. At, look, we're hardline as it relates to our national security. You know, for example, with export controls, an area within my purview, we cannot let China have access to our most sophisticated semiconductor equipment and designs, period. Like, that's a national security red line. So if that's a hard liner, then that's where we are. Having said that, like I said, we want to do business in China, um, and they need to, like, allow that to happen, respect our IP, allow us market access. And we're going we're gonna to fight for that. More, I believe, more important than any of that is investing in America. Everything, tariffs, export controls, Entities list, that's all defensive. It's important. It protects our security. We need to get on offense. We need to, like I was saying, our R&D needs to increase. Our innovation needs to increase. Our workforce needs to be trained. We can't even use our cell phones. We need to invest in our broadband. So we need to run faster in America, be more competitive in America by expanding our domestic capacity. Yeah. You talked earlier about the supply chain. So during COVID, we all realized how dependent we are on China for healthcare supplies, let alone other mm -hmm. parts of our supply chain. Mm -hmm. Do you think if we had another terrible thing like a COVID-19 breakout again, as severely as it did uh, a while ago, that we are in better shape now on the supply chain in terms of healthcare uh, supplies, or do you think we're basically where we were a year ago? Yeah, we're a little better, but not near where we need to be. I'll tell you, as a governor, um, I was up all night long, literally dialing around the world to try to get my hands on ventilators for my state. And every call was made to China or Vietnam, and it is a scary place to be. So as I think I said, in, the, in one of the packages that's before the House right now, 
they're contemplating setting up within the Commerce Department a supply chain resiliency office so that we can monitor supply chains. We don't have a sophisticated way to monitor supply chains in America, so we can invest in manufacturing and making sure that for things like healthcare, APIs, semiconductors, we make it in America. So, so I would say, no, we're not meaningfully better right. than a year ago, but if, we, if I do my job right, right, a few years from now, we will be meaningfully better. Now, some of your predecessors used to take you as business people and they would take them abroad on the trade missions. Now, because of COVID and other things, it's harder to do that. But is that something you would ever consider doing or you want them to actually manufacture more here and not spend so much time overseas? I will do some of that. I look forward to doing some of that. As I said, a part of my job is is promoting American exports around the world. But I feel, and the president feels, what the moment calls for now is like a domestic focus. So yes, I want them, I want them investing here. If the CHIPS Act passes, when it passes, it's $52 billion that the Commerce Department has to invest to stimulate domestic production of semiconductors. I need to get that right. You know, in fact, just sitting here, if you think about it, the Commerce Department is about to get $45 billion for broadband, $50 billion for chips, $10 billion for tech hubs. I know as a governor, that doesn't implement itself. So I have to, we really have to nail that. So on the infrastructure bill, a couple of questions about that. You were been involved in the negotiation of it. It's not really paid for in a traditional sense. There's not, we're not increasing taxes to pay for the infrastructure bill. Is that right? Or it's not paid for in a traditional uh, CBO sense where there's revenue definitely coming in to pay for it? Well, there is no increased revenue. It, we believe it is fully paid for through use of some unused emergency funds, some limited user fees, right, But not by tax increases. But not by tax increases, okay. yes. And yes. Um, right now, there used to be a phrase in Washington years ago called shovel ready, which meant we're ready to really use that infrastructure money to do, get something done. It turns out there weren't that many shovel-ready things, but mm. do you think there are a lot of shovel-ready things if this infrastructure bill passes? Are we going to see more money coming out quickly, or is it going to take a long time? I do. I think we've been waiting so long for this to happen that there are shovel-ready projects. Um, by the way, I know that from my experience as governor. We have shovel-ready projects. Every governor is getting ready for shovel-ready projects. But also, I would say, a lot of the money isn't for the shovel-ready projects. For example, broadband. You know, we have the maps. We know where there is no broadband. We could get to work right away. Um, this supply chain resiliency right. office, we need to set that up right away. So there's um, the electric vehicle charging stations. We can all do move out on that right away. And, you know, the president is saying to us, um, I, don't want the, I don't want talk, I want action. So I think we right. feel the sense of urgency to deliver on that. So um, the business community was thought by some to be against the view that there was climate change. At least some people in the energy industry were maybe against it for a while. Maybe they're not now. Um, is it your um, 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 appearance when you talk to business people, do they say, yes, I do agree there is climate change and we should do something about it? And how worried are you about climate change overtaking our ability to do something about it? Uh, I'm extremely worried about climate change and that we've moved too slowly for too long. Um, I, I don't know any business, I have not interacted with any business people who deny climate change. More so, I'm interacting with, with semiconductor companies who've had to close their factories because of wildfires or floods or once in a generation storms. Federal government spent $100 billion last year on disaster relief for climate-related events. Um, and as I said in my comments, you know, the only way we're going to achieve the net zero emission target that the president has set out and that many business leaders have signed on to depends on us relying on technologies that don't even exist today. So the good, but the good news is this is all jobs. When you hear climate change, you should hear jobs. That's what I hear, you know, green economy, green technologies, innovation, jobs, jobs, jobs. Question for us is will they be jobs in America or will they be jobs in China? So climate equals jobs equals our kids' future and we have to act urgently. 
So as a result of dealing with all these business people from all over the country, do you have a higher view of the business community than you did before <laughs> or a lower view? Uh, I always had a high view. You know, I, I ran a business for a dozen years. I would like to say to you, um, for my six years as governor, I worked extremely well with all the businesses in Rhode Island. Some of the best work we did was in partnership with business. And so I, I hope to... I hope to do that with you. We have a lot of work to do together, and I look forward to that engagement. Any regrets about moving from Rhode Island, from being the queen of the hill or whatever <laughs> you were, um, to coming down here or not? No, no buyer's remorse yet. <laughs> okay. Now, there was a previous Secretary of Commerce who later became President of the United States. That wouldn't be something you'd ever think about, right? That would be what, Herbert Hoover. Right. No, I'm happy right where I am. Okay. <laughs> and uh, your children are happy that they've been relocated? Surprisingly, they are. Of course, that's what I worried about. When I entered politics, I said to my husband, we agreed, if this is bad for the kids, we're out. It's been good for the kids. Um, my children, I'll give you a sense, though, of what I deal with at home. Today, my son, who's 14, was reading the Wall Street Journal and, you know, big cover story on the congestion in the ports. And he came to me and he's like, Mom, another thing you're not getting done. <laughs> Okay. Well, I don't know if I could top that, but uh, <laughs> the final question would be, um, so when you're Secretary of Commerce and you have a good idea or you want to talk to the President of the United States, we haven't really had a lot of cabinet officers in person because we've been doing COVID. So mm -hmm. what's it like to, to deal with President Biden? Is he, you call him up on the phone and get him on any time he's easy to get a hold of or just he, call him up and just go see him whenever you want? Or? Uh, I wouldn't say call him up and see him whenever you want. He's very accessible. I see him a few times a week. We were together on Friday hosting the leaders of India and Australia and Japan. Um, I, I love working with him. He's totally sincere. He's been incredibly kind to my children. I think he likes my kids better than me. Mm. Um, and he feels the weight of the moment. I'll say that. You know, when I'm saying to you all, democracy's on the line, he believes it. And so his, his thing to me, he calls me Gov. He's like, Gov, you gotta get past the rhetoric and we need some action. So I find him to be very approachable and, and very right. humble. Um, Gov, I wanna thank you very much for a very <laughs> interesting you, conversation. Thank you very much. I have a little gift for you. 